Last time we talked about how Reagan's approach to the economy will help define his presidency. As Reagan sees things, these new social programs that have been introduced by FDR, uh, LBJ, to a lesser extent, JFK, were not good. The government wasn't the answer to uh, the U.S.'s problems. Reagan's presidency, as far as economics, is also going to be defined by trickle-down economics. Basically, if you cut some slack to the people on the supply side of things, the, the wealthy, they're going to open new factories, invest, and this is going to trickle its way down to the average consumer. And we talked about how Reagan's going to have economic success. Now, you can argue that it's going to be his tax cuts that will do this. You can probably better argue that it's going to see uh, the United States is going to see this new wave of consumerism and new advancements in technologies like personal computers that will uh, bring the economy back from where it was in the 1970s. All right. So another thing that's going to define Reagan's presidency is his approach to social issues. All right. So Reagan has essentially started, or I shouldn't say started, because you can see this going back to Nixon and maybe even a little bit before that, where Republicans have started to define their party by morality. So Republicans have taken this stance that they're the party of Christianity, essentially. Part of this is a reaction to we're the ones that are hard on communists. The communists are godless. They don't have morals. We do. So to prove that, we're going to rule based on what we think are traditional Christian values. Okay, Now, their definition of Christian values might differ from people in different time periods, but that's what Reagan is going to sell himself on. I'm, I'm the moral center of the United States, and I'm going to bring us back to where we should be. Now, Reagan will rule on this morality, and it's he's going to be an unusual person to rule on this morality because he has kind of a, it's not really sordid past, but he isn't like this guy like Jimmy Carter. The guy that came before him was a minister, you know, married to the same woman his entire life, peanut farmer, uh, helped pe poor people all the time. Reagan wasn't like that. He was an actor. He was somebody who had a number of different uh affairs in Hollywood. Some of them are very scandalous. You can look them up. I'm not going to, to talk about them that much, but uh, been divorced. Um, and he's somebody who, you know, didn't have this past that most Americans at the time had. Um, so Reagan is not somebody who maybe in, in a perfect world would stand up and tell others how they should live. But that's basically his going to be his approach to uh, governing in certain aspects. Now, what what do I mean when I say this conservative morality? Well, it's going to be, it's not necessarily going to be what we would see as morality maybe in today's world. Today, we would probably say, is somebody fair? Is somebody, uh, you know, democratic? Is somebody, uh, you know, equality is going to be a big factor? Reagan, in a lot of these regards, is not going to be up to snuff. For, for example, just like a lot of politicians before him, even LBJ was this way, and LBJ is this arbiter of civil rights, uh, Reagan had said some pretty awful things racially in his past. I mean, again, you know, some of these things are fairly mean-spirited. It's not something that, you know, like LBJ would say that, you know, you can sort of excuse because of his later actions and because, you know, uh, you kind of see what, what type of person he was. Some of the things Reagan will say in that regards are kind of uh, kind of gross. Um, and Reagan's going to, when he gets into office, he's not going to do a lot in, in terms of equality. He is going to have one black cabinet member, um, the uh, his secretary for the House of uh, Urban Development for um, Urban Development will be black. Uh, not going to have a whole lot of women in his administration either. In one regard, though, he is going to be more progressive than any president before him in that he's going to be the first president to appoint a woman Supreme Court uh, justice. So this woman here, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Reagan appoints her. He thinks she's going to be a conservative uh, judge and side with you know his stance on matters. And she will in some case, but Sandra Day O'Connor, to, to Reagan's chagrin, uh, will sometimes rule with Democrats and rule, uh, you know, in, in this more liberal stance on things. But this is something that Reagan will do, um, you know, that, that would kind of fit a modern day definition of morality. But Reagan's approach to other issues will be 
moral for the time, but today we might look at it as kind of, you know, again, a little bit icky. And this is going to be in regards to his uh, response to this growing gay rights movement. Now, we haven't talked about the gay rights movement prior to 1980 because there hadn't been a lot of one. I know some people are going to argue it's going to go back to the 60s, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But it's not really going to pick up steam until the late uh, 1970s uh, and then even more in the 1980s. And this obviously isn't because there's no gay people. I mean, uh, whatever it is, you know, there are gay people in humanity since the beginning of time. The first Americans obviously had gay people. Cabeza de Vaca, when he's going through Texas in 1535, you know, he sees gay people among Indians. You know, I'll read in colonial documents about gay people. It's not something that's going to be outspoken because you're going to have this Christian uh, sort of uh, morality thing against uh, gayness. So uh, in the Bible, Leviticus, that type of thing, it's considered a sin against the Bible. And so you see during the colonial period in colonial Spanish, English, and French uh, colonies, People are going to shun on. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, it might have happened a lot, but you know, people live so far apart, especially back then. Who knows what people are doing in, in the privacy of their own homes? But we we also don't know about it much in the colonial times because because of this sort of Christian background, you're going to see a lot of laws passed against um, homosexuality um, during the colonial period. Just about every colonial administration will pass anti-sodomy laws. So if somebody uh, caught committing sodomy could be uh, punished and in some places actually killed. Um, for example, in Virginia, they had a sodomy law that said if you, you're caught committing sodomy, you um, could be executed. Now, Thomas Jefferson, the way he looked at it, being Thomas Jefferson, you know, a, a deist, not really adhering uh, necessarily to the Bible, is going to say, this is ridiculous, guys. We should lessen the punishment get rid of it entirely, you know, when he's in the uh, House of Burgesses, he introduces legislation to stop it. Um, they vote him down and say, no, the punishment for uh, sodomy should be uh, execution. Now, these laws are going to stay on the book during the Republic period. Now, a lot of times they won't be uh, carried out. You know, there's not going to be executions for sodomy left and right because, one, it's hard to prove, and then, uh, you know, you got to catch somebody in the act, and this can't just be somebody else's word against another person. Uh, and, and eventually we're going to see some uh, lessening of laws to where it's not just uh, uh, execution. So you have this atmosphere during most of American history where there are laws against certain gay acts. Okay, uh, Not only that, but again, we mentioned it's really difficult to hide, you know, or it's really easy to hide. Somebody can live with their buddy and just might live with their buddy as heterosexual friends but they might also live with their buddy and when people aren't around you know uh, obviously stuff could happen we don't know we do suspect there have been some figures in united states history that are gay but we don't know a lot for sure uh, for example, one that we suspect from U.S. history that's probably gay is this guy over here on the left. His name's the Baron von Steuben. Um, he assisted George Washington. He was from Europe. He came over to help advise George Washington during the American Revolution. And he had reputation for sleeping with men. George Washington probably knew about it. A number of the other founding fathers probably knew about it. Being at the time of the Enlightenment, where there's this less focus on um, religion in it than in the past, a lot of people overlooked it uh, they just said oh that's just a thing he does you know he's a great general ignore that and uh and, and sort of get over it and that's going to be an attitude you'll actually see uh during a lot during early american history another american that was probably gay uh, almost certainly gay is uh, going to be the 15th president of the united states this guy james buchanan again we don't know for certain but a lot of evidence points to him and um him and a, uh, a, a, a congressman from the, uh, South Carolina um, were, were probably gay partners. We don't know for sure because his niece will burn all his uh, personal correspondence after his death. So we have some that we suspect, but we don't know. And the problem with Baron von Steuben and, and uh, James Buchanan is, you know, it's, it's probably not people that the gay community wants to hang their hats on. Von Steuben did some other pretty awful things that uh, you can look up yourself. 
uh, the gay community probably doesn't want to latch on to this guy for that. And James Buchanan doesn't make a good exemplar of the gay community because he was a terrible president. The guy uh, was one of the ones who let the South secede, essentially didn't do anything about it. And as a matter of fact, provided arms that the South would later use against the North. So, you know, prior to the 20th century, we have people we suspect are gay, but, you know, we even if the ones we know we're, we're not a hundred percent certain and um and even if uh we were it's not like guys that, that really the gay community could be proud of now you are going to have some people in the 20th century that you suspect are gay and then we have long a lot of suspicions but we again don't know for sure because there's still going to be this stigma against gayness in the early 20th century And I kind of feel icky even suggesting these people are gay because they didn't want to make it known themselves. So I don't even know if we should speculate on it. You know, are we invading their privacy uh, by doing this? But one person people suspect is gay is Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you know, uh, FDR's wife. Uh, FDR is off sleeping with his secretaries, things like that. Some people suggest that Eleanor Roosevelt would go off and have her own um, tryst with uh, with her female friends. Again, some of this is based on you know letters that are suggestive, but they're not confirmative. If we knew for sure Eleanor Roosevelt was gay, everybody would want to claim her. I mean, the lesbian community would say this is awesome because she's probably the best uh, um, first lady. Uh, most important first lady in, in American history. Another more modern example of somebody that, that's gay is going to be um, this woman here. This woman's name is Barbara Jordan. She is going to be the first uh, black female elected to a southern state uh, a, a, ever and first uh, black person to be elected to the state of Texas um, as a House representative to the state of Texas after Reconstruction. You know, we talked about Reconstruction black representation then well from then until 1972 uh in the reconstruction to 1972 there had not been any uh blacks people of uh color in the texas house of representative or the texas and the united states house of representative uh but what happens in uh, 1966 a year after the voting rights act barbara jordan runs uh for the texas senate and wins and she's going to, in 1972, run for the House of Representatives for a district uh, in Texas, and she's going to win uh, that as well. She's going to become a prominent uh, congressman in the House of Representatives. And people suspect very much that she's gay, but the thing is she's never going to identify by it because during the time, even in the 1970s, there's this stigma against gayness. And again, she's probably breaking down so many doors that this is one that, you know, hey, I've done enough work, somebody else can do this. So saying all this, we've probably had prominent gay people in the United States history, but they haven't made it public because there's this stigma. And there's also, even in the late 20th century, laws against gay acts, okay? So what we're going to see is that uh, oh, by the way, here's a, uh, if you come out as gay, <clears throat> you're not only going to pa- face the possibility of legal punishment if you commit a gay act. You couldn't be uh, legally punished just for the fact you're gay, but if you somebody can prove that you committed a homosexual act, then um, uh, most states have laws against that. So you could face legal repercussions. And even if you don't face legal repercussions, you can face societal shunning if the information becomes public. Now, a lot of people, um, you know, will still be gay and maybe their close friends are going to know about it and they're going to look the other direction. But sometimes, you know, people will look at it as, you know, this is something, you know, I want to be around. Again, this sort of Christian morality that pervades the United States and uh, uh, throughout its history. Uh, One example of, of, you know, the repercussions you can face is uh, what happens to this guy right here. This guy's name's uh, Walter Jenkins. He was LBJ's. Uh, personal secretary, his assistant, worked with LBJ uh, when he was running for uh, senator of Texas. And, you know, he was there throughout uh, his time in the U.S. Senate. And he's going to uh, be J- uh, LBJ's assistant uh, after JFK gets shot while uh, LBJ's president. But during this time, he's married, but it's gonna he's going to be busted by police in a compromising position um, twice. So one time in a YMCA bathroom, uh, another time, I don't know exactly where it was. 
and he's not going to get you know executed. The law's been limited by that point. Uh, I think the first instance was 1959, the second 1964, but he is going to face a fine. And when the first one happens, LBJ almost certainly knows about it, but he just says, you know, knock this off. Don't don't do that anymore. And, and he keeps him on his staff like that. That would probably be a, a fairly common attitude. But if something like that becomes public, which it will in 1964 after uh, Jenkins gets caught this second time, LBJ fires him. He's like, I can't if I'm a scene associated with gay people, this is going to hurt my reputation. So uh, he ends up firing Jenkins. And there's also sort of this anti-communist stigma uh, on people that are gay because a lot of people uh, view if you're gay, then the Soviets can gain compromising, you know, can compromise you, especially if it's a secret. They can use that information against you because it's so looked uh, uh, down upon in American society that nobody wants to find out. So the Soviets can sort of leverage with that. All right. So this is sort of the status of being gay in the United States in the mid 20th century. Well, something's going to start to change in the 1960s. We're going to see more people become n prominent as gay. Again, there's places in the United States throughout the uh, uh, you know the, the 20th century where you can go if you're gay and you know you're going to find other people like you. You know, there are gay bars. My uh, grandfather would tell me, you know, there's the gay part of town and, uh, you know, you, you could you go over there if you're gay and then there's you know this part of town they existed everywhere uh it's not something that's new but if somebody found out again you could be shunned well this is going to change and i, it, I think this is going to come along with the civil rights movement and this is a chart somebody put together based on gallup polls uh, before 1945, only one in a hundred people started identifying themselves as gay that number starts increasing in in uh in uh, the, the 40s and 60s, and it's going to really start to double in the 60s. Um, and this is going to be, I would argue, as sort of an offshoot of the black civil rights movement. So you have um, African Americans fighting for civil rights. Uh, you're going to have women start pushing for greater civil rights. And you're going to have these minority groups, including gay people, start saying, you know, why can't I have equal rights? And as we're going to talk about, some of the main issues for gay people will be marriage, uh, allowing to join the military, and getting rid of those sodomy laws. Now, there's no specific start to when this gay rights movement happens. You'll see some history books turn to this Stonewall protest or these Stonewall riots in 1969 where the police uh, bust up this mob-owned bar, this gay bar, and they start arresting people and they just keep going back and arresting people and sort of gets to the point of harassment. Uh, you know, a lot of times the cops would get paid under the table to sort of ignore sodomy laws and things like that that are going on in these places. But they kept harassing uh, Stonewall, eventually arresting people. And uh, it's going to start turning into these major protests in, in New York. That could be it. I think a lot of times what historians are doing there is just wanting to find a specific point to to when these things start. Um, I mean, maybe you could point to that, but but there was some uh, civil rights activity before that, and there is going to be some uh, definitely after that. Well, what you're going to see is in the 1970s, more gay people will come out and start demanding those uh, specific things, you know, uh, marriage and dysotomy laws uh, allowing to join the military, and you will see the public address it. As we talked about last time, there's uh, episodes of All in the Family where Archie, you know, the conservative head of the household, has to meet his son's gay friend, and you start seeing people in pop culture appear that are gay, uh, and sort of it gets into the public consciousness. Again, before uh, late 1960s, 1970s, it was keep quiet about it, you know, we're not going to, uh, most of the time, not going to uh, uh, do any legal action against you, but just keep quiet about it and, and don't bring it public, but you start to see it become public more and more uh, in the 1970s. Well, it's going to come to uh, the attention of Ronald Reagan. So he's the governor of California before he's president, and California has these cities with large gay populations, specifically San Francisco. 
And some people, as this gay rights movement starts to grow in the 1970s, uh, will start to ask Reagan his thoughts on, you know, what the gays are asking for. Well, Ronald Reagan is going to take this approach, and this is, again, what this whole lecture is going to be about, not viewing this as a legal matter, you know, should it legally be marriage to be defined between a man or a woman, you know, uh, should it matter your, your sexual orientation, joining the military, are these sodomy laws constitutional? Instead, he's going to approach this for, from his interpretation of morality, which is sort of this uh, uh, new conservative uh, interpretation of uh, morality. And, and people ask him, what do you think about gay marriage? Um, Reagan will say basically that uh, granting these rights is to tantamounting to come tantamount to condoning a gay lifestyle which he cannot do so he portrays it not as is this something that they're allowed to do per u.s law but if i gave these rights or you know if i supported any any gay rights then i'm doing something immoral well because of this we'll see that reagan is going to essentially ignore the gay rights movement in the 1980s and it's not just him by the way it's general republican party and the democratic party because reagan's going to get so popular in the 1980s they're going to ignore uh the gay rights movement as well so during the 1980s there's going to almost be this pause button at least as far as legislation's concerned and reagan won't address gay rights if he can avoid it now in spite of this he is going to have an effect on the gay rights movement an example of this will be this 1986 supreme court case called harwick versus bowers okay so this gentleman over here his name's michael hardwick uh he's a gay man who was out at a gay bar, a place where police knew where gay people hung out. Um, he wasn't doing anything wrong or anything except for he was uh, drinking beers in the state of Georgia. And they have laws like they have here in Texas where you can't have open containers in public. So the police sees uh, Michael Harwick basically coming out of this gay bar, carrying an open beer bottle. You're fined 50 bucks. It's something that all, well, not all of us have done, but you know, it's something that a lot of people get caught with. And it's just a simple fine. Uh, Michael Harwick's got to pay a $50 fine. Well, like all of us, I think he forgets to pay the ticket. A warrant gets issued, but then he realizes that the warrant got issued, immediately pays off the warrant. Case closed. Again, happens to all of us. I, I for, I've forgotten, uh, uh, you know, uh, speeding tickets before and I've had warrants issued and I had to immediately pay them so happens to all of us now the police officer who issued this issued this or actually it's probably a different police officer but if you haven't paid your warrant they'll occasionally send police officers out to your house to uh bring you to jail you know if, if you haven't paid your warrant now harwick had paid his warrant um but there was a clerical error and uh, and the police officer sent out, even though he paid it. This isn't, again, anything you know, sneaky or anything. This is probably just a mistake with this police department. Well, the police officer gets to Harwick's house. He's going to knock on the door, and uh, Harwick's got a guest over. The guest is going to open the door. Police officer is going to say, can I come in? He's going to come in. And the guest is going to say, he's going to say, you know, where's Mike Harwick? And he's going to say, uh, he's in the back. Police officer will go in the back, and again, he's there on uh, mistakenly, you know, thinking that uh, uh, thinking that that this warrant hasn't been paid. But he goes to the back room, and Michael Harwick and his partner are engaged in sex. Well, the police officer is going to say sodomy is illegal in the state of Georgia. Again, it's been on the books, but it's almost something that's never. Uh, never challenged or never, you know, people aren't arrested for it, but the police officer arrests Michael and then he's going to bring him to jail. Well, Michael Harwick's going to try to turn this into a challenge to the sodomy law, basically saying this is unconstitutional and it violates my 14th Amendment right. Okay, so I'm being unfairly targeted because of my sexual orientation. He appeals it up to the uh, Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, the Georgia Attorney General is named Bowers, where the Bowers comes from. 
Um, they're going to try this case. Georgia Supreme Court's going to find in, that the law is favorable, and it's going to make its way up to the United States Supreme Court. There, Harwick is going to argue, again, this is a violation of my 14th Amendment, and he's going to convince four of the judges, um, four of the nine Supreme Court judges, that, uh, yes, this is a violation of his 14th Amendment right. You know, Thurgood Marshall's one of them. Uh, three other of the um, the judges, Democratic appointees by, I think, Jimmy Carter, and then I believe there might be a couple from LBJ. Yeah, there is well, Thurgood Marshall and, and I believe one or two more from LBJ. They rule in his favor. By this point, um, though, you have more conservative judges. You have Nixon judges, and you have Sandra Day O'Connor, Reagan appointed judges, and I believe two more Supreme Court judges appointed by Reagan. So that's going to be a total of uh, these five uh, conservative judges. They're going to rule that the Georgia state law is constitutional. Now, if they do this based on legal reasons, or you know, they say through their study of the Constitution, they think the law is legal. You know, maybe the national government. In, in certain cases, can't um, overrule uh, state state laws, um, but they're not going to base their ruling on legality. They're going to base it on morality. So uh, the presiding, uh, the majority opinion will be um, uh, by this guy Warren Berger. Uh, he's going to say that a Supreme Court Justice Warren Berger is going to rule that sodomy laws are constitutional because they are based on the moral teaching that homosexual acts are, quotes, crimes against nature. So the ruling is going to be based on, again, not a constitutional interpretation, but basically Berger and these other Supreme Court's interpretation of morality. That's always questionable when you do that. Again, you know, this is something you might not like, and but if the Constitution says one thing, you got to abide by the Constitution. But in this case, they rule on uh, long-standing laws against homosexuality, and again, their personal opinion that they're crimes against nature. So basically, they rule against uh, Harwick. I think it's just a uh, a small fine he's got to pay or something or a small amount of jail time. Uh, so he, he's uh, it's not like it's going to be a big issue to him. But again, this is uh, sort of this uh, morality uh, encroaching on the law. Well, Reagan in this way affects this uh, uh, this uh, you know uh, this gay rights movement. And, and again, he's sort of that's accomplishing what he wants without him having to deal with it. Well, unfortunately for Reagan, but more unfortunately for the gay community, something's going to come along in the 1980s that is once again going to sort of force or try to force Reagan to take a stand on something that's affecting the gay community. And that's going to be this AIDS epidemic that will start in the 1970s, but it doesn't really become publicly known until right when Reagan becomes president in 1981. So basically this virus, this human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, uh, it can be passed through uh, blood contact, through sexual contact, mo more easily passed through uh, gay sex, but it can definitely be passed through straight sex, can also be passed through intravenous drug use. Uh, we'll start passing along predominantly in the gay community, but also in the straight community uh, in the late 1970s, and it's going to start becoming public in 1981. Well, first a couple reports come out. You know, you can sort of uh, ignore those. Uh, the Reagan administration is not paying a lot of attention, but by 1982, 1983, people will start to be concerned about it, and they're not going to understand what this HIV and the disease that comes from it, the acquired immunodeficiency, dis or acquired immunodeficiency do disorder or AIDS, people aren't going to understand what it is. And people are going to start questioning, like, can you pass this through shaking somebody's hand? You know, is this only a thing in, in gay community? Is this something that I can get? Is this something I can get just by talking to somebody that has HIV or somebody that has, uh, has AIDS? You know, is this something that... Uh, you know, that is this something that uh, I should be concerned about? Well, again, there's going to be a lot of fear in the American public about people infected with HIV and AIDS. And a lot of people are critical of the American public about that. You know, I tend to not be simply because I saw people react with COVID. People just don't understand 
what this is. They, they just simply don't know because they don't have people telling them. And this is where you're going to see a lot of criticism of the Reagan administration because Reagan's Surgeon General uh, will basically say, we need to find out more and we need to inform the public uh, about what this disease is. We need to put some money into research and we need to make this information public. We need to put out some public ad campaigns like we saw when COVID hit. You know, you had uh, PSAs, that type of public service announcements uh, about this is what you need to do. Uh, this is how you prevent it. In the case of AIDS, you know, and HIV, don't worry about shaking somebody's hand or something like that, giving people hugs. That's not a big deal. But you're not going to get that from the government. Now, we'll see some private organizations take up uh, the, the cause of uh, AIDS and, and informing the public. But Reagan basically responds, and this is going to be a quote from him, medicine and morality teach the same lessons. Now, we don't have Reagan exactly saying this stuff. We have people saying secondhand what he says, but according to his Surgeon General, he, he sees, sees this because it primarily affects gays and drug users, and Reagan views gays as immoral. He's going to say, quote, uh, they're getting what they justly deserve. So his response is going to be to ignore uh, this, uh, this AIDS epidemic, which is going to be a problem because, again, it's going to go on to not just affect uh, uh, the gay community and uh, uh, drug users, but also uh, the straight community. So, again, it's this, this morality or this conservative conception of morality uh, will af affect uh, politics. Okay, Now... Again, I, I, I hate being critical here because, uh, you know, there's there certain things we don't know and we don't have enough time to look back and, and uh, give proper, proper judgment. But you can definitively say that, that this is uh, things he's uh, he, he's using uh, his moral judgment instead of legal judgment or scientific judgment on. Another thing that uh, you, you can sort of point to here, and this is going to be a little bit more complicated, is Reagan's stance towards mental health, drug use, and crime, okay? So, Reagan is going to look at, again, we've talked about this before, it's not the national government's responsibility to deal with certain things. Uh, and one of the things that he's going to say that the national government shouldn't have a part in is mental health, okay? So, we've talked about this before, but obviously you have people genetically or you know maybe environmental factors who knows who have mental disabilities who can get uh, schizophrenia and a lot of these people can't exist in, in society now in the past these people have you know gone to families have taken care of them in the 1800s you started seeing state governments form these state institutions for you know the mentally insane or, or something like that uh, we talked about it before with Nellie Bly, the one forum for women in New York. The state wasn't uh, putting much money into it, and there was this horrible conditions. Nellie Bly reports on what happens there. There's this big um, reformation movement to um, uh, to to make it more, uh, I guess, more uh, gentle or more nice or more uh, effective. Really, not not treat women horribly. Uh, other states, you know, they had fairly good uh, mental health facilities. Like here in Texas, there there was one uh, just outside of Austin, and, and it was fairly benign. I mean, obviously the science isn't where it was today, but the guy who ran it approached, you know, had patients gardening and things like that and would give them proper food, and, and, and uh, you know, it wasn't this horrible treatment. But that kind of exemplifies the difference from one place to another. Like some states, again— Put a lot of money into it, and the people they hired were, you know, kept up on the latest science of mental health. Well, by the uh, uh, mid 1900s, though, some states are falling behind, other states are not, and a lot of people start becoming concerned about, you know, do are we treating our uh, mentally insane or mentally impaired people properly? Uh, President JFK. He's going to start a program where the federal government will start supplying additional funds to some of these state and local hospitals. And there's going to continue to be reports throughout the 1960s, especially when the various civil rights movements start kicking up. Some people are going to say we need to go even further. Well, it's going to be this way when Jimmy Carter becomes president at the end of the 1970s. There are going to be reports that 
a lot of these state hospitals are behind and they're going to say some state hospitals are doing great. Their patients are recovering. They're, you know, uh, you know, the, the ones that can't recover or whatever been treated fine, the ones that can, they're integrating themselves back into society. But again, they're going to be reports where conditions aren't that much better than they were in, in the mental facility that Nellie Bly visited at the end of the 1800s. Well, in uh, 1978, Jimmy Carter, to address this, will form this uh, Commission on Mental Health in 1978 and basically say, go out there. You guys are a bunch of trained scientists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists. Go out there. See where this is the best. Look for a way that the national government can help and find you know, what's working, what's not. How do we need to, how can we improve things? Well, the commission finds, again, that uh, one of the big problems is these state facilities, even with uh, some federal funds are still don't have the funds they need. Uh, some people are going to describe that, uh, you know, again, certain places are doing uh, better at addressing these issues than others. And this is going to get Carter to pass this Mental Health Systems Act in 1980 to address these problems. It's actually one of the last acts that Carter signs before turning the presidency over to Reagan. And you're going to start to see additional federal funds go into these mental health facilities and states and, and cities uh, throughout the United States. So it starts to become more of a national thing than a state thing. All right, well, Reagan's going to get into office. And again, this is just his belief on the matter. He says this isn't a responsibility of the national government, which he might be right. His argument is that you're dividing the responsibility. You're dividing it between the national government, state government, and local government. So if there's a problem with mental health facility, national government could say, oh, it's the state fault. You know, the state could say, oh, it's the national government's fault or it's the city's fault or whatever. There is some validity to that. You know, maybe it is better controlled at a local level. But what Reagan is going to do is he's not going to give the national program a chance, and he's not going to uh, basically give it a chance to um, – uh, use uh, use this new research or you know give it a chance for these promised funds to reach these mental uh, health institutes because he's going to immediately withdraw the funds for these mental health facilities. Now, some people are going to say that this withdrawal of these funds that, that were promised by the federal government is going to force state mental institutions to throw people out on the streets. That's probably accurate. Now, I think a lot of people go overboard the effect with this, but what you will have beginning in 1981 is the state institutions, without these additional federal funds, aren't going to be able to, uh, you know, house as many uh, people. So you're going to see about a quarter of the people in these mental health facilities just thrown out on the street. So you might have schizophrenia, but you're not one of the really bad ones. So go get a job, go do something, you're out of there, you know, and you're, you throw somebody on the street with some mental health problems without, you know, proper medication, proper treatment, they're not going to be able to function in society. And what you're going to see is a lot of those people that were in these mental health facilities will end up on the street. As a matter of fact, you see a substantial increase in the homeless population under the Reagan administration. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of different reasons for this. But uh, a lot of people point to this uh, cutting of funds to these mental institutions. Again, you know, maybe it's the right answer in the long term, but just the way it's gone about is going to lead to um, this dramatic increase in the homeless in, in uh, the United States. So you have homeless people, uh, a lot of people with mental uh, issues. Uh, you're going to start seeing more and more people sleeping on the streets. And this is something I remember in the 1980s. Again, I can't blame all of it on, on Reagan and this policy, but there were a lot of homeless people on the streets. And I remember, you know, walking around New York and uh, being like a different world. Um, anyway, so uh, a lot of uh, homeless people also start committing crimes. You're going to see, and we'll talk about this more, that this crime had been going up consistently from the late 1960s, like 1970s. And it's going to continue into the 1980s. And this is going to be another way that, again, people criticize Reagan. I think fairly for the most part, somewhat unfairly. But 
Reagan's response to this rise in crime, some of it, you know, you can blame on him, but a lot of it's going to come from before him. He's going to adopt this morality-based approach to punishing criminals and to dealing with crime, okay? So the American public had seen what's happening in the late 1960s, 1970s, and the average American had said, I don't want any more of this. You know, we uh, increase in serial killers, skyjacking, that type of thing. We don't want... we don't want this anymore. You know, we would like a return to the way things were in the 1950s. Uh, we don't want this. Well, how's Reagan going to solve this crime problem? Again, you'd seen previous presidents didn't know what to do. You know, they had uh, tried to throw money at mental health like Jimmy Carter. Uh, but Reagan's going to adopt this, sort of this multifunctional approach, and it's going to be almost this tough guy approach. Now, some people will characterize Reagan as this guy who says, you know, arm yourself, Americans. This is how we d- deal with crime. We Everybody grab their own gun. And there is a little bit of truth to that in that Reagan would appeal to the NRA, this National Rifle Association that had been this bipartisan organization prior to the 1970s, but it started going over to the, the Democrats, or I'm sorry, the Republican side uh, in the 1970s. Uh, you know, fearing that there's going to be this government legislation against uh, certain types of guns. Reagan will absolutely appeal to the NRA, and he's going to say, I'm not going to take away your guns. But Reagan himself had actually passed uh, anti-gun legislation as uh, uh, governor of California. He, he'd uh, made it illegal to carry automatic weapons uh, in public in California. Now, Some people point out the reason he did that is because Black Panthers were carrying uh, automatic weapons in public, uh, you know, and and, uh, basically calling out police officers for for crimes against black people uh, or for for harassing black people. Uh, So some people say that's racism based, but it's definitely a a, uh, a response to. um, uh, So Reagan could have responded it, you know, again, based on his version of morality and, and his version of race. Uh, but as president, he will pass legislation that puts a ban on automatic weapons. And later on, after he gets out of the presidency, he's going to endorse a bill that will put limitations on handgun sales. He, he himself had gotten shot. Uh, John Hinckley Jr. had used a handgun. So he's not this guy that says everybody should just grab a gun, even though he'll sort of play himself up like that. You know, he's a cowboy in movies, and he's going to kind of um, uh, portray himself as a cowboy uh, as president, but what he will do, and it's, again, it's not just him; it's uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will adopt this um, very simplistic approach to crime. Okay, so generally, we think today that if you want to decrease crime, you've got to do a lot of investment in education. You've got to start to bring an end, end to poverty. You've got to, if, when you imprison people, put a lot of money into reform, things like that. It's it's not something that, you know, it, it's not something simple. But that's not the approach we're going to see Reagan take. And, and part of the reason that he's going to take this approach is because it's the simplistic approach is because American voters kind of want the simplistic approach in the 1970s and going into the 1980s. If you talk about reform, investing money in all these programs, things like that, we Americans, and I think just people in general, automatically think that, oh, you're trying to give education in prison and, and things like that. You're buying margarita machines for prisoners. And uh, I might have used this analogy before in the 70s lecture, but you know, we hate that idea. You know, somebody committed a crime, they shouldn't get to relax. They shouldn't get reform. They should be punished. Now, who's, you know, forgetting the fact that if you just punish somebody and you don't teach them anything, they're going to go out and do the exact same thing. We don't think that far ahead. We think that crime bad, punish person who commit crime. Again, simplistic. It's a kind of the responsibility of politicians to say, that's too simplistic. We need to get uh, more more uh, sensible, but Reagan's not really going to do that. He's going to hear the American public say, I don't like this crime that's happening in the 70s. You do something, and Reagan will say, I'm going to do something. I'm going to start locking people up. 
So what Reagan will do is he's going to pass a series of laws uh, as president, and Republicans will approve of this with the support of a lot of Democrats, by the way, uh, that will strengthen uh, the prison system in the United States. So I'll, I'm going to give you one of these these various acts he's going to pass. This one called the Comprehensive Crime Control Act in 1984 is going to make it that um, uh, certain crimes that are traditionally handled by states uh, and local governments will now become the federal government's jurisdiction, which is kind of opposite of the rest of his reforms. But he's going to say that things like arson, certain types of murder, if it's a murder for hire, and there's any connection to interstate lines or any connection beyond the state or local level, the federal government can try them. So, you know, when you go to court, sometimes you get tried by the city or the county uh, or the state. Certain things we want the federal government to handle. Is also going to say that um, criminals that are caught in violent crimes or using firearms, and again, this isn't something that necessarily sounds bad, but it's just going to be kind of going beyond uh, uh, what some people expect. Um, people that use firearms and are caught multiple times with firearms can uh, have to face certain sentences. So if you're caught in a crime with a firearm, you've got to serve a minimal of, uh, I think it's something like 12 years or something uh, in prison. Um, made it for, uh, raise the minimum uh, sentences for certain crimes. So judges that... Um, uh, well, sometimes, and this is very infrequent, I think it's only like 40 times in, in American history where judges in, in certain crimes have, have you know, passed them a minimum sentence. But a lot of people get angry if somebody that you know, killed somebody or robbed something only has to serve a small amount of time. Reagan will say, you know, we, we don't want the judges to be able to do that, even though they very rarely do that. So we're going to raise the minimum uh, uh, crime level or minimum uh, jail time for certain punishments, okay? So increase uh, penalties for certain uh, crimes. And one of the things is going to be drug use and sale. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, so this is this tough. If you commit crimes, forget about rehabilitation. You're just going to have to go to jail for a much longer period of time. So we see this at the federal level, and this is going to be extremely popular. Um, we'll see state governments follow suit. Um, they're going to start extending prison sentence for state crimes. Local governments will start doing that as well. And we'll see that this will lead to a dramatic increase in the prison population uh, in the United States. When Reagan gets into office, I don't have the exact numbers. I think it's something like 360,000 uh, prisoners in the United States in both state and federal prisons. Uh, owing to these laws, that's going to um, more than double uh, by the time he, he gets leaves the presidency. And it's going to start this dramatic increase in the amount of people in prison. So before Reagan, you see it was fairly consistent at, what, 200,000 people between federal and state uh, prisons. Um, that's going to go up. And the United States today is this... Um, uh, most imprisoned population in, in the world. Um, and again, this isn't just federal governments, but you're going to see it as far as states as well. Now, some states in the United States will, in recent years, start decreasing things because they're going to realize this is expensive. Building new prisons, expanding the federal government in this regard is expensive. So again, this kind of goes against Reagan's smaller government philosophy in that we can have bigger prisons, more prisons, uh, the federal government gets involved in punishment more, kind of goes against his, his general philosophy uh, of state government. So in this regard, again, it's, it's morality is going to trump some of his, his other uh, philosophies, okay? Now, probably the biggest contributor to this rise in uh, prison population isn't going to be firearms or people that commit assaults or violent crime. Instead, a lot of the people that are going to be going to prison are going to go because Reagan is going to dramatically increase the punishment for drug-related crimes, okay? So we talked about this when we were talking about the 70s. In the 70s, drug use in the United States quintupled. Basically, from late 1960s to 1980, 
I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. I gave it before. I think it was 5% of Americans had tried marijuana in 68 or something like that. And it had gone up to 40 by 1980, 40%. And then you're going to see significant percentages try heroin, start trying cocaine. Um, well, Reagan is going to blame this drug use. Basically look at this increase in drug use. Same way he looks at these other issues. This isn't a scientific problem. This doesn't have something to do with the person's brain, whatever it is that causes pleasure centers or whatever is being triggered in the brain by these substances and then is going to cause addiction. It's not that, but instead it's sort of a weakness with the individual that they're being addicted with drugs. And he'll view it as people that start using drugs and people that are addicted to drugs. It's, it's a moral issue, okay? And he's also going to view it not necessarily as, I should, should say, he's not necessarily going to say blame it all on the people that use drugs. He's also going to blame it on the people that supply the drugs. So it's part the weak person that takes the drugs, and it's also the evil person that is going to introduce the drugs. Again, not this scientific approach as we're, we're kind of looking at it these days, but this moral approach. And as a matter of fact, he sort of epitomizes this in this speech he makes uh, saying, uh, quote, drugs are bad and we're going after them. So when Reagan gets into office, he's going to start this war on drugs. He's not the first to say that. Nixon had said that before him. But Reagan's really going to embody that more than any previous president. So some of the programs Reagan's going to introduce aren't going to be very controversial. And I think even today you'd probably say they're simplistic, but they're well-meaning. Uh, one of the big things that Reagan will do is he's going to use his wife, this woman right here, his name's Nancy Reagan, to start trying to introduce and educate kids about the uh, you know the dangers of drugs. Now, Nancy Reagan is a pretty interesting woman. She was an actress who actually met Ronald Reagan. So it was at the time, it was the late 1940s when uh, Congress was working with Hollywood to sort of uh, blacklist these uh, communist sympathizers in uh, in Hollywood. And Nancy Reagan had accidentally been blacklisted. A different actress with a name similar to hers had, um, you know, been to a communist meeting or something. Who who knows? And she basically said, "That's not me. I want to work." She went to Ronald Reagan, who was the head of the Screen Actors Union, something like that. Uh, and he worked with Congress and says, you know, you know, these other commies are bad, but she's not. Uh, and they started dating. Um, Nancy Reagan and him are going to have uh, a couple of kids. And um, she's going to support him when he becomes governor of California. She's not necessarily going to be like Eleanor Roosevelt. And then she's going to be outspoken in her political opinions. But she will help Reagan kind of in the background for most of his presidency. Now, some people will say some of the background help was controversial, like there's stories about her hiring an astrologer to help um, set Reagan's schedule. I think some of those things are overblown. True, but, you know, I don't know if she, you know, how much she said it by this astrologer's, uh, what the astrologer said or anything like that. Uh, but for the most part, she, she is sort of in the background just being supportive. But the one way she is going to be up in front is this say no to drugs campaign. A, um, you know, the president has this sort of moral view of drugs and, you know, both him and Nancy realized that um, one way to get out ahead of drugs is to tell kids uh, what can happen at a young age. Uh, and I believe it was about 1982, a young kid asked Nancy, well, what should I do if a friend of mine says take drugs and St. Nancy says just say no and this became a big thing and they're going to start this just say no campaign again completely simplistic it's it doesn't differentiate between drugs and those that are ad addictive those are you know recreational or whatever but I, I think you know I'd, I'd probably agree that you know if you can get kids to stay away from drugs or something anybody can agree that's a good thing uh, and so Nancy will start going on TV shows and will start, um, you know, going on this show right here. This is one of the most popular show at the time. There's different strokes. Um, and, you know, I believe the episode was somebody asked Arnold, the star of the show, 
uh, if if he'll use drugs and he thinks about it. But then Nancy Reagan comes in. No, drugs are bad. You know, you might watch it, it might be completely different than how I'm remembering it. Uh, but she'll do things like that. Other shows she went on something like I think Dynasty. Uh, anyway, but she starts giving out these messages and she'll start going to school and saying, you know, just say no. Again, this this simplistic message, but I honestly. A lot of people say it's ineffective, uh, and there have been a lot of studies about the effectiveness of this this program. I, I kind of think this may have worked for me because it scared the hell out of me, you know, at least certain certain drugs. And other things going to come out of this Reagan administration, um, like this uh, uh, This Is Your Brain on Drugs campaign. Uh, the Reagan administration will push money for PSA, and Nancy's going to lead this national government movement. But like most things, Reagan wants private individuals, maybe states to handle a lot of matters. So what you're going to see is a lot of these private organizations like this. Uh, uh, this is your brain on drugs. This is basically a, a company out of California puts together this ad campaign and says, um, hey, we think that if we say kids' brains will turn into a scrambled egg if they do drugs, uh, th- then they won't use them. Now, I've heard studies say, yeah, oh, this didn't work. It, it sure as hell worked on me. Like I... I scared the hell out of me. I don't want my brain to turn into a scrambled egg, and the scrambled egg looks gross. It looks like there's uh, somebody uses too much soap in the dish or something. But um, it was this oversimplistic message, but I, I would argue effectively. Some people argue um, uh, it wasn't that effective. But that part isn't really the controversial part of uh, Reagan's War on Drugs. The part that's going to be controversial is going to be this sort of aggressiveness that, that Reagan will use. So one of the things he's going to push through is as soon as he becomes president is something called the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to take U.S. military and it's going to put them in traditional police roles. Again, Reagan's traditional stance is states can handle things, but when it comes to drugs, Reagan is going to say, no, we need the national government to, to head this. So what he's going to do is say Coast Guard ships, instead of guarding the coast against potential invasion, uh, you know, watching for, you know, a danger or whatever like that, terrorism or something like that. We want you to stop drugs coming in from other countries. A lot of these drugs, we'll talk about this more in a second, are coming from South America. So I want you on drug patrol duty. Now, the Coast Guard had done this to an extent before, but this is going to get the Coast Guard working directly with the police to to stop these things. Uh, we'll also see, and we'll talk about this more in a second, that uh, uh, this is going to allow the police to also use military um, military uh, equipment that they wouldn't normally use uh, to bust drugs. Um, so the uh, uh, Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act, if the military's done using its equipment, equipment that you know would go to fighting invaders or whatever the military's used to doing, uh, but it's, it's now, you know, a, it just doesn't work or it's, it's old or something like that, sell it to the police. And you'll see that the police, and this, again, happened before Reagan, but it's really going to accelerate during Reagan, will start wearing body armor. And they're going to start using these tanks and things like that. Uh, And it's especially going to be prevalent when searching for uh, drugs, narcotics, uh, you know, um, uh, things like that. Now, this isn't the first time, again, that we had the military used for police keeping you could say sending the 101st airborne to protect the kids at little rock central high you know that's a military using them for an untraditional military thing but that's temporary um and you could say this militarization of police it had happened a little bit before but man it's really going to accelerate at this point and this is going to worry a lot of people that see this blending of lines between the military and police and Because the Founding Fathers basically said, we don't want that. The Founding Fathers didn't really talk about police very much, but their whole idea with the military is protecting from foreign threats. Now you're going to see a lot of blurring the lines. This is going to concern a lot of uh, uh, political historians. And and, and, and today you see a lot of uh, militarization of the police that it causes uh, some issue, or at least causes concerns uh, with the public. A lot of people say that uh, really accelerates during the uh, Reagan administration. 
So sort of this militarization effort to stop, stop drugs. Now, the things that Reagan is going to do is that he's going to, and we talked about this before, increase sentences for drug offenses, okay? So again, the idea is that if you sell drugs, and even if you use drugs, you're at fault. The problem's with you, not some chemistry or anything, and you need to be punished for it. So there were already heavy punishments in states, and if you're trafficking drugs or if you carried over uh, state lines, federal crimes, you could already be punished heavily before Reagan gets into office. But Reagan's going to pass a series of laws that are going to dramatically increase the uh, punishment. So let's see here. I've got the numbers somewhere here. Anyway, it's it's basically... Uh, um, uh, you can, uh, if you, he's going to increase by one third the the punishment for certain drugs. So if you're caught, uh, you know, bring mar- marijuana across uh, federal uh, state lines, it's now a federal crime. I'm making up this number, but before maybe it was a three year sentence. Now it's going to be a five year sentence. Um, and the the way he's going to do this is in this uh, one particular act called the Anti Drug Abuse Act. It's going to be somewhat illogical. So. We need to punish longer sentences to serve as a deterrent, but we want to specifically hit certain drugs. Now, some of this is logical. You know, you want the more addictive drugs. If you think punishment's the answer, heroin hit that more, cocaine uh, hit that a little bit more. But what uh, we're going to see with this Anti-Drug Abuse Act is that certain drugs that are more used by white community will be punished less than those used by the black community. So cocaine in its powder form, this is almost like a designer drug. You see people on Wall Street using it. Uh, That's going to carry, I don't have the exact numbers here, it's something like one-tenth the sentence than crack cocaine, which is the same substance in a slightly different form, uh, would carry. So all of this together is going to lead to a dramatic increase in the prison population but it's going to disproportionately affect the black community, specifically uh, uh, for crack cocaine and, and some of these other drug laws uh, as well. Uh, but we'll see the prison population go up in part because of this. And again, disproportionately uh, black community for sort of this illogical wording. And again, some people will say that it's because of Reagan's sort of inert racism. Um, that, that this is the reason that this is happening. So dramatic increase hard on drugs. Uh, Reagan's anti-drug attitudes will even have international repercussions. So Reagan, the way he sees the the way to stop the drugs is, is again, not what we're kind of getting into today, which would be, you know, medical help, you know, intervention, prevention, uh, although to an extent with the prevention, but instead stop the drugs from coming in the United States. Well, we have the military and, you know, you'd start having the Air Force patrol the border, the uh, Coast Guard patrol down here. Reagan would say, and this part's accurate, that a lot of these drugs are coming from Colombia, some from Peru, and they're making their way either through Cuba or Central America into the United States. So Reagan is going to blame these countries for America's drug habit, not, again, the Americans although, again, he will to an extent, but the people that are selling them, uh, we need to stop the supply coming in. Well, this is going to be a problem because in certain areas like Colombia, because of this American desire for drugs, you'd start to see these big cartels, like the one under Pablo Escobar, this is probably the most famous one, had been making tons of money uh, shipping drugs to the United States. Uh, Pablo Escobar, we won't go into his background too much, but he's from Medellin. He's going to start this Medellin cartel where they grow this cocoa plant um, and then uh, or coca plant, and then they're going to uh, harvest it, produce cocaine, and then they're going to ship it using a variety of different methods through Central America or you know through the Caribbean, uh, bringing on boats, um, a lot of these speed boats, things like that, going to Miami. And uh, uh, Escobar is going to make a ton of money off this. Well, Reagan, if he had his druthers, Colombia's down here, he would like to send the military down here to Colombia 
to help get rid of the drug users. He also wants to send the military to Colombia because there's a huge communist movement in Colombia, this FARC that is uh, is in the countryside of Colombia that you know is trying to push Colombia towards a communist state. So Reagan wants to direct military intervention with Colombia, and it uh, you know not giving that to start pumping um, arms, uh, start pump, pumping firearms into Colombia uh, to uh, put down these drug dealers. Well, at the time, the United States is anti-interventionist, or they're slowing down with the interventionism post uh, JFK, and especially more post Vietnam. We don't think this is a response. So when he requests money to either give to the Columbia to help put down the FARC and to help uh, put down these drug dealers, uh, Congress is going to say, no, we're not doing that. Now, Reagan will send CIA advisors and a handful of military advisors here to Colombia in order to catch Pablo Escobar. And eventually, with uh, the CIA's help, they will catch and, and kill Pablo Escobar. Um, but he is somewhat limited about what Congress uh, will allow him to do. So, you know, it, it's basically tiptoeing in this wild-ass situation down here. We have the Colombian government that's fairly friendly with the United States, drug dealers, um, communist revolutionaries, and we didn't even mention it. This is something that's, uh, you know, if you guys want to look it up, this paramilitary group that's anti-communist, but also dips their toe in the drug trade down there. And it's, it's the sort of the United States has to tiptoe, and Reagan can't directly deal with it, so he sends these military advisors. Again, with Colombia, it's a confusing situation, uh, and the United States is going to have a difficult time stopping the supply side. Things are going to get even more difficult for Reagan uh, during his administration when he learns about 1984, 1985, that some of these drugs are coming out of Colombia to the America through Nicaragua. Nicaragua in 1979, a communist group, the Sandinistas, uh, had taken over Nicaragua through a revolution and then through legitimate democratic elections had been reelected in 1984. Reagan wanted to do something about that. He wanted to send uh, weapons to this, these Contras that are fighting the Sandinistas, these right-wing Contras, to have them overthrow and return the government to you know, a capitalist pro-Western government. Congress wouldn't allow him to do that. Again, worried about intervention, what happened in Vietnam. Maybe this will escalate. So they won't allow him to do that. So you have these Contras that Reagan wants to fund. And we're going to talk more about this uh, when we talk about communism and, and uh, uh, Reagan's response to that. So he has these Contras that can't get funding from the United States. Reagan wants them to succeed. Well, he's going to learn that the Contras are fighting the communist by getting money or by getting money by taking supply shipments from uh, Colombia, cocaine shipments, and selling it to the United States. So he's got this group that's dealing drugs to the United States. Reagan doesn't like drugs, but they're using the drug money to fight communists in Nicaragua. Very unusual situation for Reagan. Now, there are um, a lot of people, what I'm about to say is, is sort of this controversial thing, and we don't know how much Reagan's involved in it, and we don't know the full extent of it, which is one of the reasons I hate teaching history that's so recent. But there's reports that Reagan or one of his top advisors basically gave the thumbs up to the Contras to deliver the cocaine from Colombia to the United States as long as they delivered it to inner cities. It's okay to deliver there. Uh, so the CIA contacts basically allowed the Contras to sell cocaine there to fund their anti-communist movements to uh, further their you know, fight against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, but only as long as they sold it to inner cities. Again, I don't know the extent of that. There's a documentary on Netflix about it that makes a case for it. There's still some questions to be answered, but that's it's kind of this gross thing, if, if it's true. It also kind of fits a little bit with Reagan. He's anti-drugs, but as we're about to see, um, he's also staunchly anti-communist. So it wouldn't be beyond, you know, um, pushing morality out of the way uh, for pro-communism. And as we're going to talk about later, he's going to try to fund these uh, contras and other ways that the American public would uh, would would not find, um, you know, would not approve of. So basically, Reagan 
using morality to dictate social issues. Again, you know, a lot of people are going to say the policies don't work. I, I think I agree with that, but we little too close to history to know for sure. Um, but but it is sort of this uh, morality justification, this new brand of uh, conservatism, uh, you know, uh, to approach these societal problems. Well, before uh, we end today, I just want to briefly say that, again, this isn't only Reagan with these sort of simplistic approaches to uh, to these problems. The American public is generally going to buy into what Reagan is saying, and you're going to see them this attitude that Reagan's uh, pushing forward, not just his approach to social issues, but also his approach to economic issues, reflected in pop culture of the time. The biggest show, at least uh, for uh, part of the 80s, is going to be a show called Dallas, and it's about these uh, oil tycoons, I guess. They they uh, run these um, oil fields in Dallas. They um, I'm trying to forget the... Uh, is it Three Forks Ranch? I'm remember, forgetting the name of the ranch that they were. Uh, somebody's going to yell at me for that. But they uh, lived at this ranch in this uh, the Big Eyes JR, and they're basically wild catters. They're making these oil fortune, and this allowed them to buy huge ranch, helicopters, all this fancy stuff. And it's almost this worshiping of capitalism. Now, the people are gross uh, in, in sort of their worship of capitalism. Lism, um, not all of them. You have some characters that are good, but um, uh, but it's sort of this exemplification of capitalism. And these guys are using sort of these shady ends to get money. Again, this would go along with sort of this mentality in the 1980s that you know uh, this is all ends justify the means. Uh, ends justify the means, which would sort of be uh, Reagan's approach to things. Uh, you see this like also in movies of the 1980s. Uh, most popular movie in, the, in or one of the most popular action movies. There's so many uh, good action movies in the 1980s, but just about all of these um, exemplify this attitude of if there's a problem, tough guy approaches the way to get to it. You know, let, forget complex solutions. It's getting tough on things. Um, example I like to use, although you could talk about Commando, Rambo, um, Rambo 1 actually, maybe not, but uh, Commando, um, uh, Lethal Weapon, Predator, all these things feature these guys that don't have time for bureaucracy. They just want to solve a problem, get the bad guy, and um, and, and take them out. And, you know, forget the the people. Uh, they're going to slow you down. Again, Reagan sort of this uh, push back against bureaucracy, simplify things, uh, and Lethal Weapon. You know, the bad guys are off. They're killing people. These guys are constantly stopped by, oh, you need to fill out this paperwork. Forget paperwork, you know. I need to get things done. Again, you see this in all these 80s movies. These uh, 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 bureaucracies, the, the bad thing, you know, get things get things done more efficiently. This cowboy attitude. Um, other popular culture in the 80s, like even stuff you wouldn't think of as being... Um, as being, you know, uh, something that would fit along with this Reagan mentality, uh, like Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters is a comedy and it's hilarious. It's probably one of my favorite movies as a kid. Uh, is about catching ghosts. These ghosts are haunting New York. These guys go out, have hilarious adventures, busting these ghosts. But one of the main villains, and perhaps the main villain uh, outside of Gozer, you know, isn't isn't a ghost. It's it's the EPA. The EPA has come in, and the Ghostbusters are trying to stop these ghosts. But this EPA guy is so angry because he doesn't want him to have a nuclear reactor in the middle of New York City. Oh, he's such a jerk for doing this. Uh, and uh, the, I think a little bit of this is, is owes to this guy who plays the, the character, the EPA character, a guy named Walter Peck. He's such a a villain, but that fits along with the attitude of the '80s. Is um, Again, um, uh, we need to get things done, but we can't because you're in our way. And in the first Ghostbusters movie, the mayor stopping them from, you know, getting the job done. We need to cut through this paperwork uh, and, and get things done. Again, you're going to see this in uh, other films and music as well. One of the uh, most popular musicians at the time will be uh, Madonna. She's going to come out with her single Material Girl. It's not going to be about anything deep. It'll be... You know, acquiring stuff, wealth, capitalism, uh, things like that. 
And as we're going to talk about, you can obviously see counterexamples of this. You'll see people pushing back against this sort of more conservative attitude. You'll see the rise of heavy metal, and we'll talk about a little bit later. Hip-hop comes out at this time uh, that sort of pushes back against this mentality. But even in in their own way, you'll actually see heavy metal and hip-hop also exemplify this uh, sort of Reagan-era attitude. And it's not just popular culture, film, and music. Um, you'll see, oh, one other thing I said about popular culture, one thing that you'll see that's kind of, uh, innovative and you definitely saw it in the seventies, you're going to see increased representation. So we kind of talk about the eighties as this time period where maybe a regression in certain ways. One way that is advancement, there's going to be advancements is, uh, as far as black representation in cinema and music, probably the, at least for part of the eighties, uh, later eighties. Uh, most popular shows is going to be the Cosby Show about a, a black middle class family. Uh, the dad's a doctor. I think they live in New York or Chicago or something like that. Um, and it's going to be the most popular show on television. Uh, most popular music star Michael Jackson, black entertainer. So you know there is going to be some sort of uh, societal advances, especially in in terms of uh, and entertainment. Uh, other ways that entertainment is going to change in the 80s and sort of re- reflect what's going on in the attitude um, is, is going to be televangelism. Again, people think morality is, is uh, uh, going out the door with what happened in the 70s. Uh, you're going to have people going on TV and saying, well, you know, we need God to, to answer your problems. Send us a little bit of money and you'll help improve the situation because we're here fighting the good fight. Uh, doing this for you so you'll see these tv preachers um sort of get into this mid thing between entertainment and religion uh as pop culture continues to become uh bigger in people's lives uh you know as it was uh started to grow in in the 60s and 70s and continues in the the 80s you're also going to see in the 1980s uh, further growing of, of news media. Before, obviously, since you had the television, you would have news come on every night for an hour, you know, hour and a half hour, something like that, and tell these news stories. Well, you're going to start seeing in the 80s, and it's going to start with the CNN, like channels that are going to be entirely devoted to news. You have cable television where you get not just the channels that are going to be broadcast, but channels will be brought to your house. Uh, and some of these channels will be st- specific news channels uh, to where you can look at the issues of the day um, 24 hours a day. Now, we're going to talk about later how this is going to expand further, but you really see the heart of it in, in, these, in the 80s. So just think that 80s has got this pop culture reflecting sort of the morality and, and the economics of the 80s as well. All right, next time we'll talk about uh, Reagan's attitudes towards communism and and how this is going to uh, reflect in, in the U.S.'s continued fight with the Soviet Union.